Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is uh, what is Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m., March 31st, Calgary, Alberta. I'm happy to be here. almost forgot what day it was. Um, yeah, this is Child Abuse Prevention and Human Rights Abuse Prevention is up to us. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live Internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And you can sit in the chat room. I actually have my chat room up and running here tonight. And we're looking at the Survivor to Thriver workbook. We've been looking at that for weeks now. It's a huge workbook, 115 pages long. We're on page 85, and um, it's just a, an awesome workbook. I found it at www.ascasupport.org. So that's A-S-C-A-S-U-P-P-O-R-T.org, and it's a great workbook. Um, you can go on there. That's the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. Um, it's a Morris Center program, and I've been on the website checking it out, and uh, that's where I found the workbook. And you can go and pull up that workbook, too. You can just go right to the site, pull it up. Um, it's free for anyone who wants to work through it. And, um, you know, they, they, there's a, a chapter there. The very first chapter is called Safety First. And that chapter is like 30-something pages long. And it just tells you, like, they really place Safety First uh, as, as really the most important thing in our healing journey. So we want to be in a safe place when we're doing the workbook. We also want to be in a safe place when, you know, like if you're listening to this show, so important. I'm a, I'm a, the reason I'm doing this show is, you know, I'm very interested in child rights, human rights for all, and um, but especially child rights. You know, I'm a survivor, I'm an adult survivor of child abuse, and um, watched the destruction of my family and, and just the dysfunction in my family, and it just tore the family apart. And, um, you know, I know that so many people out there are suffering with this. I, I know it. I see it in the paper. I, I see it on the news. I grew up with a lot of my friends who, who came from abusive homes, and whether it was domestic violence, domestic abuse, or um, child abuse. So I know it's happening. I've seen it firsthand. Um, and also I have run into so many people in my lifetime who have grown up in abusive homes and were abused as children. And I know that there's just... Uh, it's so sad to say, but there are millions of us out there. So I just wanted to be one more voice, you know, to say, look, we're not alone, and we don't have to suffer in silence. We don't have to suffer alone on our own. We can get help. There's help available. Uh, there's uh, even, like, some support, like, uh, online group support, you know, if you can't get out to some of the meetings uh, or if you're just not comfortable in that setting, there's online support. There are uh, there's groups that meet around, you know, the different cities in, in all over North America. And so there's help for people like us. And I never started reaching out until about six months ago, I'd say. And I couldn't believe all the hands that reached out back to me. I couldn't believe it. I was just really uh, kind of shocked by it. I didn't realize that I'd have that much support. So I, and most of my friends are listening right now. Thank you so much. I've got friends in, in Australia, friends in the U.K., friends in Canada, friends in the United States, and friends all over the world, actually. So everyone, I thank you for tuning into my shows, and I really appreciate it. It, it, does, it matters to me, and I, I really appreciate your support. So that's what we're looking at. You know, I'm, I'm just a survivor, and I really think that we don't hear enough about child abuse, except for the really bad reports that come out of the news of children being killed and murdered at the hands of their parents or caregivers, and also, or they're in the hospital due to to uh, abuse-related injuries, and this is what I want to stop. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and I'm so happy to stand with them and just to be a part of, of this awesome 501c3 not-for-profit organization who are, you know, promoting awareness, education, prevention of child abuse. And, you know, we need to do all we can to stop child abuse uh, and prevent it from happening. And, and it's so important that we all get involved no matter what way it is. And so I thought, you know, I'll just be one more voice just out there just to say we need to stop child abuse. And uh, as a survivor, um, I also like to bring to my shows uh, survivor issue material because there are so many of us out there. No one wants to talk about it. And, you know, I'm just... Uh, I just decided to go public with my story, and I thought, you know, more people, the silence is the issue. That's why abuse is allowed to happen. It just gets pushed under the carpet. No one wants to talk about it. No one wants to deal with it. The public just doesn't want to have anything to do with it because it's such a, it's such a problem. There's 
people can't figure out exactly how to stop it. But if we don't start talking about it, we're never going to find the answers to that. We're never going to find the answers to, to how we're going to stop child abuse if we don't all start talking about it like right now. So that's what I'm doing, and I'm paying to do my own show and uh, just to bring some information to people as I find it and um, just to get the word out. We need to stop child abuse, stop human rights abuses, period. And so, yeah, we're looking at the Survivor to Survivor Workbook. It's not a professional show. I don't hold any professional counseling certificates or therapist certificates. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a therapist or counselor. This is not uh, meant to replace professional help. You know, so listen at your own discretion, please. And if you're a young person under the age of 18, make sure you have an adult or someone who can listen to the show with you, who's like a mentor, like a, a teacher, uh, a, you know, a, a coach at school, uh, a neighbor, someone who you really trust and you know they're trustworthy, um, or your parents, you know, hopefully you have a parent, I just pray that you do, that cares about what you're listening to. Because uh, child online safety is is such a huge, huge, important issue. And you'd be doing yourself a favor and myself a favor if you would get someone to listen to the show with you because... There's so many online uh, sexual predators out there trying to get a hold of kids, and they use all kinds of manipulative ways to do it. And we're going to cover that actually in, a, in a, probably about a week or so. And you can find that information. Just get on there and start typing in online safety for children, and you can bring up all kinds of really good information on how to stay safe online. Uh, we did a, a bit of a, a show on that on Dreamcatchers Talk Radio last uh, Tuesday night, last night, and you can go and catch the archive at www. Uh, dot blogtalkradio.com forward slash dreamcatchers and if you need more information get a hold of me on that so we're going to cover we're going to continue on here with the survivor to thriver workbook we're on page 85 and it's chapter five stage two morning and we actually covered this I, I i read this part um monday night but i want to read it again because it was at the end of the show when i read it and i want to start out this next chapter this next section here stage two morning uh with this chapter five and um, morning is, is quite interesting what they had to say here. So I'm just reading right from this page, and that's www.ascasupport.org. You can pull up the Survivor to Thriver workbook, and you can read right along with me. I might add a few things in there, but mostly I'm just reading from the workbook, and then I add some of my own personal stuff in there sometimes just to give people an idea what someone like myself experienced, and, and, and it, you know you might be able to relate to it, and then you might not be able to. Uh, there's some stuff that I relate to with other people and some that I don't. So we all experience a different abuse, different uh, severity of abuse, different time lengths of abuse. So you want to make sure you're in a safe place when you listen to this show. So if you haven't come very far in your healing, then it might be a good idea to turn it off. If you're a survivor of child abuse and you're an adult survivor and you're just now beginning your healing journey, sometimes it's not a good idea to get too far ahead. And the, the Safety First chapter, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier, um, the Safety First chapter in this Survivor to Thrive workbook is so important to go through. So you might not want to listen to this show. You could always come back and catch the archives, or you can just read the the workbook yourself and I would cover the safety first chapter first because that we did go through that and it's been about two well, probably about three weeks now uh, ago since we read that but so important if you're a survivor of child abuse and you're just beginning your healing journey that you don't move too fast or you know you need to move at your own pace and that's what they said in this man in this workbook and I really like that because they said that people really have to move it at a state at a, at a pace that's comfortable for them and so that's why we're on Chapter 5, Stage 2, Morning. This might be way too far ahead for some people who are just beginning their their um, healing process. So that's why I say listen at your own discretion. And if the topic makes you uncomfortable or, or you just can't, uh, it's just making you uncomfortable, please turn the show off. That's why I say everyone listen at their own discretion. It's so important because we want to be safe, right? We want to uh, move forward slowly in our healing process and not regress. That's part of the Safety First chapter um, in this Survivor to Survivor workbook. They say, you know, you don't want to regress in your healing. You want to move forward, but you have to move forward at a very steady and careful and, and uh, even pace that's comfortable for you. So that's why I say please listen at your own discretion and you will not be hurting my feelings if you turn the show off. And, and you can always come back and listen another time when you're feeling a, a bit stronger or maybe you've just a, had some real healing happening, which would be just awesome. And so that's just the thing. You want to be safe. So I'm just going to start reading right from the page here. It says, uh, in Stage 2 Recovery, the focus shifts from the details of your past abuse to the impact of the abuse on your adult life. 
and this stage represents the intermediate point in your recovery in which healing and change occur in tandem, each reinforcing and uh, complementing the, the other. As in the fourth step of Alcoholics Anonymous, the cornerstone of stage two is taking an honest inventory of your current life problems and then dedicating yourself to changing the behaviors that are making your life unsatisfactory. For adult survivors, this means going beyond awareness of your self-sabotage and taking direct action to deal with it. And it says here, stage two also requires you to delve deeper into your psyche to face your shame, a core feeling experienced by many adults from dysfunctional families. Ultimately, you must challenge the shame and turn it around into self-acceptance, which will then become the source that nourishes your new self. And this will enable you to accept and express your grief over the disappointments in your childhood and mourn the loss of your dream of an ideal family. By letting go of childhood hopes for the parents who failed you and and feeding your budding self-acceptance, you give birth to a new sense of entitlement. And you will be free to be your own person and to choose how to live your new life. By altering distorted perceptions and beliefs, learning how to control your aggressive uh, behavior, you will foster changes in your personality that will end forever uh, the possibility of your continuing the cycle of abuse with the next generation. Rarely does recovery proceed in a neat step-like progression, especially during this middle stage. There will be times when you stray from the focus on your abuse and head off in a new direction that uh, in new directions that seem either too pressing to ignore or likely to yield valuable insights. As you develop confidence in your ability to assert your opinions and even disagree with your therapist, family, and friends, you may find yourself examining your relationship with them. And this is a desirable and healthy development because it indicates that you are learning to express your newfound sense of autonomy. So that's just awesome. That you know, we, we this is sort of the step where uh, this stage two, um, where we actually take action to deal with you know instead of. Uh, self-sabotaging or, or whatever we do in our life that, that kind of cause our life to be unsatisfactory as, a, as adults uh, of, you know, adult survivors of child abuse, right? Um, we can take action and learn how to deal with this stuff and then learn how to have a good life. And that's what I keep saying on all my shows. You know, we deserve a good life. We deserve to have the life that we didn't get as children. And, um, you know, that self, that, that nurturing and just really starting to love ourselves for who we are and lo- learning to love love ourselves, period, and to love life and to be happy and, and find some peace and some joy in, 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 in this life. You know, it's so important because if you survive child abuse, uh, then you know how hard and how painful it is and how hard it is as an adult to, you know, when I'm at work, I'm fine as long as I'm busy, but, you know, I get home and on the weekends or if I have too much time to think, you know, to sit around and think about things or someone's birthday will pop up and I'll remember things or uh, certain times on, you know, certain days of the year that I just, things come to my mind and brings back all kinds of memories and stuff and, um, you know, it's so easy to sort of stay trapped in that. So, you know, it's great to be proactive and start looking ahead to the future and start you know, like like most normal people do, you know what I mean? Having some goals, some short-term goals uh, that we know we can accomplish so that we don't set ourselves up for a fall, you know? So set up some realistic short-term goals that we know we can do, and that sort of helps build confidence. And, and you know, I started out by, um, in my healing journey, I started out years ago by telling myself, hey, I do count. I do matter, you know what I mean? Because I, I was told I was worthless and worth absolutely nothing to my mom and, um, you know, really made to feel uh, useless and worthless. And so I took that on and, and took that kind of with me as an, as an adult. And even though I, I could have fun and still had friends and everything and, and could still have a good time, in the back of my mind, I could always hear those words ringing through my mind. And I started to think, no, you know, I, I do count. I do matter. I do deserve to have a good life. And uh, so I had to really start working on, um, on my own self-image, you know. So so important. So step eight. We're going to start step eight. Page 86. And that's the Survivor to Thriver workbook. I have made an inventory of the problem areas in my adult life. And that's where that's where they set this whole thing up here. I have made an inventory of the problem areas in my adult life. And it says the initial step of stage two recovery involves taking a full and honest inventory of the problem areas in your life. Because you first have to identify what you want to change before you can begin to change it. By now, you should be fairly clear as to how the abuse has affected your adult life. If you are still unclear about this, review the checklists and exercises in Chapter 2. And it says you may also have identified additional problems that you did not recognize earlier. If so, add them to your inventory. 
This inventory is more than just an accounting of your problems. It will serve as the blueprint for the changes that you need to make to create the new you. Wow, that's interesting. I really like that. I, I need to do that for sure. Uh, self-help. They, they do have some recommendations here, like they do recommend self-help and also stuff for professional help, and it's quite lengthy, so we'll read those. The self-help portion is number one. Go back and review the journal entries that you have made to date and make a list of the concerns and problems you have identified. Which of these problem areas are the most disruptive to your life? Which need to be resolved or eased before you will be able to resolve the other ones? And are there any that need to be dealt with so you will not lose something important, such as a personal relationship, a job, or even your life? For example, if you can't afford the cost of therapy and have lost your health insurance benefits because of unemployment or underemployment, the lack of a job may be the biggest barrier to your moving forward in recovery. It says if you are depressed and immobilized in your life, and are contemplating suicide, then getting help to manage your feelings is a, is a high priority for you. It would be top priority, I think. If you feel that you might strike out at your child, thereby risking legal charges of abuse as well as renewed feelings of self-hatred, then you should focus on parenting issues. Absolutely important. Uh, you know, we have to not, not you know, continue that cycle on, right? We want to stop that uh, cycle of abuse, right? It's a, if you did not already do so in Chapter 2, rank each of these problem areas in descending order of priority and use this ranking to help you select those areas in which you need to focus your energies. So that's some good advice. I really think so. Um, number two is in ASCA meetings. This is if you were going to ha go to some of the, the, the hosted, uh, some of the cities in North America host the ASCA Adult Survivors of Child Abuse meetings. Um, my city doesn't have one, but that doesn't mean that yours might not. You can check in the phone book or check online at www.ascasupport.org. They do have a listing of the, some of the, the stuff that they, they that they have available. You know, they have uh, online uh, online support, they have web-based support, they have uh, group support and all kinds of stuff. So um, you can check that website out. It's really quite uh, it's quite good. He said, in the ASCA meetings or any kind of group therapy, I guess you could just say, talk about this process of making an inventory. What feelings arose in the process? And what were some of the difficulties, surprises, and successes in creating this inventory of your adult life? So we could talk about it with with our counselor or therapist, we could talk about it with our group support people or just, you know, our, our good friend. Like if you have a friend who's supporting you through your adult uh, journey, uh, you know, healing from child abuse, um, which would be so great if we all did, you know. Um, I did for a while and then, and then the friendship ended. But, um, you know, it's it's hard to find people that are willing to stand with you. And, and it's great when you have somebody in your life who will be there for you like the whole way. And... Um, uh, you know, my sweetheart is there for me the whole way, that's for sure, and he's really the only one that is. And, um, you know, it's I have some other friends, and uh, I'm not going to mention names on the air, but I've got um, a special friend that I speak to who's there for me all the time. And this person, this woman, uh, has a heart of gold, and she's there for me no matter what. Good days, bad days, it doesn't matter. And that really means a lot to me because um, so most people just can't, they just have a hard time having that empathy. You know, they have a hard time being um, that person who can just be a shoulder because sometimes that's all you need. You just need someone to hear. You just need someone to listen uh, and, and, and someone who understands, who, you know, who can say, you know what, my heart is with you. And, you know, because I'm, I'm a good shoulder because I know what it's like to be in pain and I know what it's like to be hurting, you know. 30, 40 years after abuse, you know, and um, I know what it's like to be dealing with, with child abuse issues, so I know how hard it is, and so I like to be there for people when I can be, and, you know, my resources are limited, uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, I work full time, and I, my sweetheart is terminally ill, and so I, I try to help him out, which he ends up helping me out most of the time, but I do try to be there for him, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite busy, but the thing is, is, like, if I have some time, and I, and somebody pops in and wants to chat, you know, why not just be an ear for them, because sometimes people just need to know Know someone cares and and it's you know that's the whole thing it's hard to find people that actually really do care and so um, you know if you find someone who really does care and is there for you uh, you know let them know that uh, that you appreciate it because honestly I'm so happy when I have people that, that pop in to talk to me and I tell you the difference it makes in my life is just awesome you know and these people I'm not going to say names but they'll pop in you know on Facebook or wherever and they'll just say hi and it and it just brings a smile to my to my face it brings love to my heart because these people actually care about me and I mean that's awesome because I grew up in a home where 
you know, nobody cared about me. You know what I mean? Obviously, they were hurting me, and, and uh, you know, in every way. So it means a lot to me as an adult to find people who actually care, <clears throat> you know. So it is so important to find a really good friend uh, who you trust and who has proven themselves trustworthy to, you know, help us get through all this stuff. So important. And professional help. These are the recommendations for that. This is review your inventory of problem areas with your therapist and discuss how to best address these life issues as you continue to heal your inner wounds. This will give you a sense of control over your recovery and will help you learn to speak up for what you want and negotiate an agreement about the direction of your therapy. While your therapist may have reasons for wanting you to address certain things first, it is your decision that counts the most. So that's really that's good advice, I think. And then we... You know, because we get to to be uh, sort of in control, right? We should be in control of our recovery. Uh, it allows us to have to to be proactive. You know what I mean? To take on that role, and so therefore, you know, it gives us um, a bit of confidence, and we can say, "Hey, I'm I know what I need," and you know, and and if you don't know what you need, then you can at least take a look at it and say, "This is what I think I need." You know, so it's so important, right? That we all that we that we are a a real active part of our recovery. So important. Some of the problems, this is number two, some of the problems you will likely identify such as physical ailments, sexual problems, severe mood disorders, parenting problems, and work-related concerns are common among survivors and may require the services of specialists. In general, this is the time for you to develop a more detailed treatment strategy for the various symptoms of the abuse that do not readily remit through your um, remit through your weekly therapy sessions. This is in keeping with a holistic approach to recovery one that seeks to take the best of each therapeutic modality and apply it strategically as part of a comprehensive treatment plan. So that's important. You know, we have to find, like I've even heard lot on lots of different websites that they said, you know, if you don't, if you find a therapist who's just not uh, connecting with you and they just don't seem to have, uh, it's just not helping to, you know, it's not an insult. It's just that they, maybe that's not their specialty. And they said, you know, to make sure that you, that you find out, uh, you know, what they specialize in first, and then because they, you know, then you might need to find another therapist who actually specializes in what we might need, right? In our in our own uh, in our own uh, issues, abuse related issues, we might have to find someone else, right? So they said, you know, just keep looking and until you find a therapist or a counselor that really uh, understands and, and can actually help you help us, right? So important. Number three, for example, if you have body memories that manifest themselves as muscular aches and pains, soreness in certain areas of your body, or decreased joint flexibility, consider seeing an acupuncturist or who may be able to provide either topical or systemic relief for these symptoms. Acupuncture treatments can also trigger the release of specific feelings, especially fear and anxiety, that may then become localized in the specific areas of the body that were directly affected by the abuse. However, unless your acupuncturist is also a trained psychotherapist, you will need to continue to work with your therapist to identify and resolve the underlying feelings. And, um, yeah, that's just, you know, the, these uh, abuse-related issues, you know, because of the stress and the strain that, that they put on your psyche can manifest in the body. And that's, that's true, absolutely true. If you hold yourself tense or, you know, if you're holding yourself tense all day and just the abuse-related injuries from childhood, right, um, and then you go on to be an adult and you're tense and tired, um, they can really, uh, you know, manifest in the body. So important to make sure that we take care of ourselves. You know, if you weren't taken care of as a child, right? Uh, obviously, that's you know, most abused children are not looked well at, looked after as children, right? Um, then we have to learn how to take care of ourselves. And it's a. I, I was talking about that on some of my other blog talk shows not too long ago, uh, because it's so important. It's so hard to have to learn this stuff as an adult, which most people it just comes natural to them. Uh, but you know, we have to actually learn it, and it's like. Okay, you know, adulthood 101 or something, you know, um, how do we, how do we do this? And so it's so important that we just realize we need to eat properly. We need to get uh, exercise. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to get rest and sleep. And, uh, we need to, you know, they always suggest yoga or, uh, meditation or, you know, for me, I just, you know, I love to read the Bible. So that's where it brings a lot of peace to my heart. But um, other people have other things that they might enjoy doing. And they said, you know, like going for walks or, or reading a really good book or just things like that that just can bring some peace to our heart and, and allow us to kind of relax and calm down and breathe. You know, there's all kinds of breathing techniques that we can do. Uh, I, I kind of suffer from a little bit of anxiety. It's not a bad, in, it's not too bad, 
but you know I notice it myself certain times certain things happening around me or whatever it causes me to have a little bit of anxiety and and you know not too bad but it's controllable but I notice it and I tend to tense up and become kind of tense and nervous and um you know it's just it's hard to not do that you know in certain situations right so I try to kind of just learn to relax and breathe I'll do some breathing like deep breathing and things like that and just think about positive things and stuff and kind of get my mind back around and get my breathing back around and it does help for sure there's lots of ways we can help ourselves we just have to keep looking for what works for us right everybody's different and we all have different like what might, might work for you might not work for me and what might work for me just might not help you at all see so that's the thing we all are different and we just have to keep looking for what's going to work for us right and then it says here sexual problems can be addressed directly using specific behavioral techniques however these may be outside your therapist's area of expertise and you may need to seek a referral uh, to a specialist severe mood disorders especially in survivors whose parents were similar, similarly aff afflicted may uh, have a, a physiological base and may not be um, a delayed reaction to the abuse. If this is the case, therapy may be more effective if augmented by some of the newer psychotropic medications. You will need a referral to a psychiatrist for a medication evaluation and ongoing monitoring. Likewise, parenting problems uh, may require either a consultation with your pediatrician or a referral to a child or family therapist. So that was their recommendations on, for, on professional help. And we've only got about three minutes left, but this is such a good workbook. I mean, I really, I've just really gotten a lot out of it. It's really, I'm going to go through it on my own after, at some point later this summer probably, uh, take some time and actually go through it myself. And uh, it's such a good workbook. I really enjoy it. I, I know there's probably just hundreds of really good workbooks out there. I haven't run into too many because, like I said, I never started reaching out until about six months ago. And and I just started the blog talk radio show back in November. So, you know, I was studying human rights, child rights, uh, but more just the international, sort of the UN Convention on Child Rights and whatnot, you know, for the world's child rights issues and the lack of them. And um, so that was mo mostly my focus. But as I started to reach out, I realized that there's so much good information out there for survivors, too, as I was looking into child abuse uh, information and whatnot to, to stop child abuse. And I started to see all this good information out there for people. So just keep looking for it because it's out there for sure. And what we'll do on uh, Friday night, we'll look at step nine. I have identified the parts of myself connected to self-sabotage. That's really important. Uh, I think, you know, because a lot of times if you've suffered from, you know, child abuse as a child, um, it's so easy to sabotage our own lives. I was doing that until I was about... Um, well, I don't know, mainly up until I was about 21. And then I started to realize that I wanted to have a good life. And uh, and I was still not self-sabotaging, but I wanted to self-harm right up until I was about 41. So, I mean, it just tells you that if I would have reached, that's why I say reach out and get some help. I really wish that I would have reached out and got help a long, long time ago. I just didn't trust the system. I didn't trust the therapist. I didn't trust anybody, period. And uh, once in a while, I'd meet one person here and there that I trusted, and and then generally that just ended bad. So I just didn't trust very many people, and I certainly didn't trust counselors and therapists because I was told my whole life from my parents that they were just out to hurt people and use their information to 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 hurt them. You know what I mean? So we were kind of brainwashed as children, and um, so this is the thing. It just sort of didn't occur to me that I could that I should get help. You know, and I, I I'm so happy now that I know that. There's really good people out there who really just want to help. I've met quite a lot of them and uh, just over the last six months and just seen some really awesome people out there. So just keep reaching out. Keep that hope alive, you know. And that's what I say. Just keep reaching out. Um, you're bound to run into to some something that's really good that's going to help you get through this. And, you know, if you don't reach out, it won't happen. You know, if, if we want that good life, we're going to have to actually go and get it. You know, it's not going to land in our laps. I mean, unfortunately, it usually doesn't happen that way. I wish it did. But we have to take the steps to, to do it and to change how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about life, you know. So that's why I say, you know, keep that hope alive and just keep working, you know, slowly, moving forward really slowly. At, well, and, you know, as slow as you want, but at your own pace. 
and, and at your own time so that you're comfortable with the way that your healing process is going and and you know and, and accept it and say okay this is going so good and you know you might have a setback a little setback but that's okay you just say okay well tomorrow's a better day you know we just have to keep on going and keep reaching out and and just keep that hope alive so you're all in my heart and in my prayers and i just thank you so much for everything and um you know take care of yourselves i'll be back on tomorrow morning 5.30, actually I'm changing the time, 6 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for one child abuse survivor to another, and uh, we're just going to continue on looking at understanding crisis from the www.childwelfare.gov. So there's some more interesting stuff on there that I want to cover. So 6 o'clock for half an hour tomorrow, I'm going to try that out and just see if it, see if I like it, And um, because uh, 5.30 is quite early. So, um, well, and half the time I'm just having coffee trying to wake up. So thanks everybody for tuning in, and you know, take care everybody. My heart is with you. If I can do something for you, let me know. And if you just want to chat, you know, get a hold of me on blogtalkradio.com or Facebook. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.